Welcome more gamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Stuff, and today we are going to the chaotic wastes of the Mortal Realms and talking all about the Slaves to Darkness and their newest battle tome that just recently dropped. If you've been a longtime viewer, you know that I love the Slaves to Darkness as a faction. It's just they embody everything about chaos that I like, the path to glory, the, the constant battle with temptations from other various chaos gods, and just the whole, I don't know, the whole look, armor, everything, magic, I love it all. And so in this video, we're going to talk about what the Slaves to Darkness are, what they represent, some of the, the little interesting plot threads going on, because in my next video, we're going to really get into the updates with the newest story elements. And we'll get to all of that right after a quick word about Not Just Gaming, an awesome store over on the East Coast with up to 30% discounts on all kinds of products from hobby supplies to games workshop stuff. Whatever project you are planning next, they got something for you. And every single time you use the link in my description down below, it goes directly to supporting me, my wife, our cats, all of it. And I could not be more thankful to everyone who has used that link already. And I'm going to level with you. If the, the idea of just Slaves to Darkness in general doesn't get you ready to like windmill slam the buy button, not much will. Because this is, to me, peak Warhammer. These guys and maybe like orcs. So for those of you who are new to the game, have no idea what this is, when I say Slaves to Darkness, it conjures some kind of interesting things. What is this army all about? Well, to put it as broadly as possible, these are mortals, mostly humans, but there's also some elves and some chaos dwarves here and there. Mostly humans that have pledged themselves to the pantheon of four or five chaos gods. The fifth one being the Skaven one, but that's not relevant to this discussion. There's four biggins. Nurgle, the god of like despair and disease, Korn, the god of rage and anger and war, Slanesh, the god of like temptation, pleasures, ambitions, and Zinch, the god of change and magic essentially. Plots and schemes. And you see, demonic forces, they exist in this like realm of chaos that's kind of all around us and sometimes in thin places can tear into reality, but demons don't really materialize very easily in a natural environment. But what they can do is whisper things to mortals in their dreams, in their day-to-day -day activities. Maybe it's just a little a thought you have after a co-worker is, a, is particularly rude to you about just taking a crowbar across their head. That's corn being like, that's a great idea. Jerry's a terrible boss. Remember that time you requested Gehinish knocked off and he totally ignored it? That's a little inside joke if you're totally new to the system. But, but essentially they worked their way into reality by whispering to mortals and seeded their mortal devotees so that those mortals would then conduct rituals to then bring the demons in. Essentially corrupting the smaller minds of the mortal realms in order to gain entry. When I say smaller minds, I don't mean like the dumb tribal people because the highest levels of society were tempted as well. Like the most educated people were all tempted by Zinch just as the most aristocratic were tempted by Slanesh, generals by Korn, you know, it's everywhere. Every level of society everywhere. But when I say small, I mean is mortals who don't have the psychic like wherewithal to know what is trying to eat them and devour them. They're playing with forces beyond their comprehension. The deities know of it, meaning Sigmar and Nagash, they understand that there's chaos gods and have been working very diligently to keep them out, but your average mortal who's getting directly whispered to doesn't necessarily. And so, one could say, the Slaves to Darkness were really born on the first time that any society or high-ranking member of it dedicated themselves to these mysterious forces. And in making a pact where he offers their soul uh, over to the deity, you have become a slave to darkness. Their founding coincides with a time period in Age of Sigmar lore called the Age of Chaos. This is the moment when chaos forces from the realm of chaos broke through first with mortals and then with demons shortly afterwards and just entered into the realms in mass. Every single deity had one of their forces going to every mortal realm just about. Although some of them favored particular ones, like Nurgle favored Giran, the realm of life, Zinch really wanted Chamal in the realm of metal, Korn wanted the realm of fire, Akshi, and so on. At this point, there's a bit of a side story when it comes to the elven gods and Slanesh, but if you're new, don't worry about that, it's not relevant for our immediate tale. Go check out the Slanesh playlist for that. And while you and I as players of the game might recognize the maggot kin of Nurgle as having mortals that have succumbed to the promises and temptations of Nurgle and received his blessings, and the same thing for the Zinch Arcanites and the uh, Corn Bloodbound, all of these things have their own 
forces, but what makes the Slaves to Darkness unique is that they specifically either do not worship any of the Chaos Gods, meaning they worship Chaos as a, an equalizing thing and I will bow before no one, which is very Chaos-y, or, more commonly, they worship all of them as a pantheon. That is to say, I don't trust that any one of those four Chaos Gods is the ultimate, you know, capital U deity, but as a group, they represent primordial truths that have always existed. They are collectively a pantheon of gods to worship. And this makes up the overwhelming majority of Chaos Forces. In fact, it makes up the overwhelming majority of forces in the Mortal Realms, period, amongst all factions. It has uh, been alluded to in previous books, specifically the previous, I believe, Battle Tome for this uh, particular army, that when we talk about these momentous battles of the Stormcast and their huge city-states that they're erecting and how they're expanding, to put that in perspective, that is like pinholes of light in an all-black canvas. Like, it's as if there were only three or four stars in the sky and the rest is just black void. Like, I mean, chaos took over everything and all the heroics that we read about represent just the most minute bits of the realms. The rest of that is covered with slaves to darkness and other such creatures and factions, but the overwhelming majority is specifically this army. And a fun thought just occurred is like a lot of people are very excited for the upcoming Cities of Sigmar uh, faction as they're doing preview stuff. And I am too. I'm very excited about it. It's one of my favorite armies in the story setting. But people often look at that as being, well, this is what we'll play if we want to get a sense of what an average person is like in Warhammer Fantasy Battles, an Empire dude. But the truth is, in Age of Sigmar specifically, I truly feel like the Slaves to Darkness represent the average person growing up in an impossible place and doing what you need to survive either through passing on, passing on ancient traditions where you worship certain deities and they grant you certain boons before battle, whether you're nomadic or you're like a princely researcher at some chaos thing that's trying to understand how Zinch controls the stars. Whatever, I'm making all this up as I go. But the idea is this, this is your average Joe by a wide margin. And so now that we've introduced them conceptually and to the scale of how much of the setting they represent, we're going to kind of go one more step into the depth of it, right? Okay, so don't head first jump into this pool. We're going to we're going to toe dive in here. One of the things that's important to remember is that a lot of the war bands that we see are actually corrupted tribes that existed naturally. The Age of Myth, which is the time before Age of Chaos when everything was supposed to be like super good and serene and everything was growing and prospering. Well, that still saw different kinds of people living at different technological levels. There were achievements of, you know, engineering and arcane science, but then there were also just small nomadic tribes that moved around actually every year in, in kind of perfect harmony with their environment. And they'd feud, and some of them would make bargaining trades or come to a relative peace, whatever. Oh, you know, it's complicated city-state stuff. Diplomacy. Well, specifically for those tribes, when they talk about the Chaos Gods, they don't necessarily say Nurgle, Zinch, Korn, Slanesh. In fact, those, I guess, archetypes may have just been retrofitted onto previous deities. So let's say that there is a tribe out there that's walking around and, oh, we don't know anything about those four guys. No, 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 we worship Thor, Loki, Odin, and Hela, or something like that. But as long as those four characters, for the purposes of our example, are assigned to various Chaos Gods, they pour their worship out and the Chaos God still receives it, even if they don't even know their own name. And so this is where it gets super fun, because as we look at the various tribes and like specifically the Warcry Warbands, they're worshipping Chaos, but they don't fully understand like all of it. So a tribal warband may like, we hunt in the name of the Red Judge, and we see him as this, you know, a just God who decrees judgment upon everything he touches. Well, in fact, they're worshipping Korn. They just don't know his name. The reason I bring this up as a key part of their lore is because the second you crack open this battle tome, you are going to see that there are all different kinds of units with tons of different aesthetics, um, different keywords because they key into different deities. You can kind of mix that up for some of them. The point is, this is a widely diverse army. You could have a warband that knows all four of the Chaos God names because they're so in tune with, we'll call it the warp or the realm of chaos that the gods openly speak to them. You could have a group of people that only acknowledge three of them instead of four. 
And then it turns out that it's not three of them. It's actually just Nurgle just representing his little trifold aspect, his little symbol. It's like a, a triangle of circles, if you will. Or it could be one deity that the tribe worships, but they've kind of molded all four aspects of the Chaos God's pantheon into one. And so to them, they are monotheistic, but of course they're powering and generating renown for all four. And so that's what it's like. It's very much in the eye of the beholder. What this means on a practical level is that because the army is so diverse, if you come up with an idea that sounds cool, this is the army where you can make that happen. Like, I think more so than any other faction in the game, and that's why I love it so much. Now, realistically, when it comes to the wide swath of, of different types of Slaves to Darkness warbands that are out there, there's actually only really one defining question, at least there has been for quite some time, and that is, do you follow Archeon? If you don't know who that is, Archeon the Ever Chosen is its own character. He's a unique character. He's the leader, so to quote unquote, of the Slaves to Darkness. Basically, he is a leader who is mortal. He's taken power and gifts from all four Chaos Gods, but never let himself become a demon prince. He didn't fully commit to any of them. He just keeps taking the gifts, but he keeps all four of them in check. His goal, ultimately, is to just, is just to kill everybody. He's like, I hate everything about these deities so he is ascending himself to a deity like power to strike them down so he is simultaneously the pantheon of chaos god's worst enemy and also their mortal champion because he gets the job done as he's out accruing power and you know belief and trying to ascend to a demonic state on his own like ascending to godhood rather than demonic i'm sorry the Chaos Gods are like, he's doing all the things we're asking him to do. Our armies can follow as long as they pay a little bit of allegiance to Archeon here and there. Once they get to wherever they're going, we take control again. And so he's leading our forces across the mortal realms. He's an ally of convenience for all four of the Chaos Gods. He shows up prominently in most of the stories we've covered. I have dedicated videos to Archeon. He shows up in most of the campaign content that I've covered. And if Archeon represents the mortal champion of the forces of chaos, then his sort of, I guess not really right hand man, but a person of equal, slightly less renown is a character named Bellicor the Dark Master. Like Archeon, he was a mortal champion. However, Bellicor was ascended to demon prince power by all four of the chaos gods. He is eternal, immortal, he draws power from all four of them, but at some point in his history, he did something to shame them, whether it was to try and rebel against them, again, like Archeon wants to do, or if he just failed somehow. But they have basically said, you're going to always crown the prince of the mortal champions, in this case Archeon, but you'll never get to be the champion. So it's like a, a torturous, doomed existence to always being the bridesmaid, never the bride, but... He gets to keep doing and doing his own plans. We'll talk a whole lot about him in my next episode because he's making some power plays that are awesome. But let's start by, by wrapping up our introduction to the slaves with asking the question, why is this cool? The idea of Warriors of Chaos, which is what they were called in Fantasy Battles and now Slaves to Darkness, is to me, like, like I said before, peak Warhammer. It is the thing that got me into the game, specifically with the original path to glory rule set which used to be chaos exclusive you would build a random war band of mortals around a champion and then grow that into an army and that has obviously changed quite a bit in the years and i love what it is now but that seeded the idea of like when you build a slaves to darkness army you are telling the story of one hero's rise to power and the way that age of sigmar allows you to bring that story to life of uh, having lieutenants or lesser heroes for the purposes of list building in the army who ascend to becoming the general if yours is struck down. They can be turned into spawn, which is like an eternal punishment of being like a flesh mutating hunk of ness. Or you can win the ultimate prize and ascend to demonhood, but that even that is like not always the best outcome. Look at Bellicor. And so to me, what the real beating heart of this army is, is storytelling. I'm sure that it's good on the table. It's got a lot of really cool things in this book, but at the very, very core of it all, you can tell the story of any champion, whether it's a tragic hero, someone who did the wrong thing, but in their mind for the right reasons. They could be just a pure villain who's just, I am chaos because chaos. They could be hunting artifacts, trying to attack particular cities. They could do anything, be anywhere, and look like anything. 
and this battle tome and thank you games workshop for for sending that to me came with uh, even more options than it had before because now there's a whole bunch of new Warcry cry warbands that are actually in the book rather than having to find a, a pdf online there's new characters new models for many of the classic units it is the best time to be a warriors of chaos slash slaves to darkness player and now that i've sold it to you i'm going to direct you one more time to a <laughs> discount link down below I'm just playing. But those those are my thoughts on why I love the the Slaves to Darkness so much from a storytelling element that whatever list you build, as long as you keep picking models that you like the look of, you will have a thematic and cohesive storytelling list. And it just works. And I love it. Tell me about your particular warband. First of all, does your hero have a name? If so, I'm curious, how do you structure yours? Do you try to worship all four chaos gods, meaning you hand out marks of chaos equally with a mix of them? Do you focus on one or another? I would love to hear about it. Tell me in the comments down below and I will respond to you there. Thank you so much and happy wargaming.